Let's go in the Bible to Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> and we, we grew up right here in North Carolina, but the God, God sent us to Texas to pioneer a, and pastor a church. And in Texas, there's different types of storms. We talked about storms in our last session. Uh, <clears throat> there's different types of storms that come. You know, in North Carolina, my wife grew up here in Wilmington, and they have hurricanes. And so sometimes they have to board up the house. They have to get generators sometime to provide electricity if the electricity goes out because during some of those types of storms, those types of things can happen. When well, Texas, we have tornadoes, right? And I wouldn't really accustomed to tornadoes, right? And then also we have bad hail storms. So I remember one time I was leaving the church and I was, I was going home and I asked my wife, I said, well, hey, would you like me to pick up something for supper? And she said, sure, that's good. And so I'm on the way home. Well, they had given us a hail warning that we might have some help. Um, but a lot of times, you know, I'm, you know, they give us warnings, but nothing ever happens. <clears throat> so I thought this was going to be one of the times. So I'm driving down the road, and it's dark, you know, and it's not supposed to be dark, but it's still a bit dark. And so I'm, <clears throat> I'm just cruising down the road, and I'm talking to my wife on the phone, and all of a sudden I saw a softball like this roll across the road while I'm driving. And I thought, some kids throwing a softball in my car. And I looked over. I didn't see any kids. I didn't see anybody playing. Next thing I know, I saw softballs start falling everywhere. It was softball-sized hail. Now, normally we don't have that. It's very rare. But it was a big, I was bigger than a baseball. It was falling, right? And that, what I saw was literally one that had fallen and was rolling across the road. Okay? So fortunately, I looked up. I realized what was happening. And so when I looked up, God blessed me, and there was a car wash right there with an awning. So I was the first one. I turned in and zipped under that awning, right? And as soon as I pulled in there, boom, boom, boom. I mean, it started coming down bad. And I mean, cars were trying to get in. A few got in, but some didn't. And so I'm sitting there watching some of them outside of it, and their cars are just getting damaged like crazy. I mean, it was big dents and everything. And, and many, many homes, I would say 50, probably 40, 50% of the homes had to have their roofs redone because of the hail damage, right? So that was a big type of storm. And so, fortunately, we didn't have ones like that all the time. That was in 20 years we had one like that. Uh, but those are not ones to go through. But the thing about storms is you, when you go through a significant storm, you remember it. You know, I remember that very vividly, right? Well, in our life, we're not talking about storms in the natural, but all of us go through storms in our life. Not necessarily weather storms, but we can have relational storms, we can have financial storms, we can have physical storms, right? They come to us and they all, they come to each and every one of us. It doesn't matter who we are. We're all going to face some storms in this life. And the thing is, there are some keys that we need to understand of how to overcome the storms of life. And we talked about, you know, last time we talked about different, there's different types of storms. And here's the thing. Sometimes we make a mistake. God wants to deliver us from every storm. That's number one. The Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers us from them all. So God wants to deliver us. But here's the deal. There's different types of storms that require different responses. And sometimes we stay in a storm because we're doing one response, but that's not the response that we need to get out of that storm. And so we talked about different types of storms in the Bible. And let's go to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24. And the good news is it doesn't matter what kind of storm you're facing, God wants to deliver you. Let me say that again. It doesn't matter what kind of storm you're facing, God wants to deliver you. Right? Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24 it says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, will, will, I will liken to a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, everybody say, does not do them, them. will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on the house, and it fell, and great was his fall. So when we look at this, we can see that there's parallels between natural storms and also some of the storms that we face in life. And there's different principles that we can learn. First of all, it's important to recognize that no one is immune from storms. If you're having a storm in your life, that's an indication that you're a human. 
Because they come to us all. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what kind of education you have. It doesn't matter who your family is. Storms come to everybody. And sometimes we can see people and we, we think, man, they don't have any problems. They got problems. They may be different than ours, but they got, everybody's got storms. And then we can see, based on this scripture, being a doer of the word is one of the main things that we can do to overcome the storms of life. If there's one thing I could deposit in your life this morning is the fact that if you choose to be a doer of the word, that's going to empower you to overcome the storms and challenges and temptations that come your way. Being a doer of the word. And notice, you had a man that was a doer of the word, then you had a man that was not a doer of the word. But I want you to notice that the storms came to both of them. See, being a doer of the word does not inoculate you against the problems of life. Problems still come even if you're saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. But being a doer of the word will cause you to be able to overcome and cause you to be able to continue and stand even when the storms blow against your house. So we have to be determined to be a doer of the word. Everybody say, be a doer of the word. Now, here's what's interesting about these two men. One, the Bible says he did not do the word and he was foolish. It is foolish to not do the word of God. The other man was, he was a doer and the Bible says he was a wise man. So your actions determine what kind of man you are. If you don't do the word, you're foolish. If you do the word, then you're wise. Somebody said, well, I'd like to have wisdom and knowledge. The easiest way is to be a doer. When you hear what's communicated from the pulpit of this church, do what it says. And the Bible says you'll be wise. And not only will you be wise, you'll overcome the storms of life. Right? And see, both of these men faced storms. One overcame, one didn't. Now, I also want you to know we're not told what happened next, but let's think about it for a second. So the one man was not a door. He had the storm came and it destroyed his house. So he probably was distraught. He probably thought this storm took me out. Right? Another man said, you know what? We had a storm come, but God. So both of them went through a storm. One ended up with problems. The other ended up with a testimony. I don't know about you, but I want to be in the testimony department. See, sometimes people say, you know, you heard one person say it like this. You can't have a testimony without a test. Right? I remember Brother Hagin used to say, well, pray when something wouldn't go right. Instead of complaining about it, he would say, well, praise God for another opportunity to believe the word. How many of you know that's a different attitude? That's a different attitude. Right? The good news for us is that everybody in here today, there's good news for because you're here. So the devil has taken his best shot at you, but he didn't win. Because you're still in the house. I, I, I might have gone through something. I might have been wounded a little bit. I might have a scar or two, but I'm still standing. Amen. That lets me know he already didn't win. I heard a minister one time said the devil was messing with him, said, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. Every now and then it would just come, and he knew it was the devil. And he said, the Lord, finally he was praying about it, and the Lord said to ask, he said, the Lord said, the next time the devil says, I'm going to kill you, ask him why he hadn't done it yet. If God be for me, who can be against me? Amen. Now, Romans 8.31 says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And these words are written by the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul went through a storm. But it did not stop him from fulfilling his purpose and destiny. See, opposition is going to come. Opposition is going to come against your life, your ministry, your destiny, your relationships, your finances, your health. 
But it can't stop you if you keep your eyes focused on the Word of God. Amen. But one thing is, we got to have a fighting attitude. We got to refuse to quit. Right? We got to refuse. It doesn't matter what, what it looks like. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to be defeated. I'm not going to be denied. I'm more than a conqueror. This setback is not going to cause me to fall back. It's going to cause me to step forward. Amen. Amen. Now, we talked about two different types of storms. Number one, Jesus got into a storm. Remember, he was said, let's go to the other side. There was a, a demon-possessed man at the Gadarenes, and he was going over there, and he was going to deliver that one, and he was tired from ministering. So he was asleep on the boat, and all of a sudden a storm came. And the disciples were freaking out. <laughs> and they said, Master, don't you care that we perish? And the Bible says he got up and rebuked the storm. Said, peace be still. Rebuked the storm. Started speaking to the storm. See, the problem is sometimes we complain about the storm instead of speak to it. <laughs> right? So he spoke to it, said, rebuked it, commanded peace to be still. And then he's turned to the disciples and says, where was your faith? In other words, why didn't you do something about it? Amen? Now, why did Jesus' storm come? Because he was in the perfect will of God. See, there's only two times the storm is going to come in your life, when you're in the will of God and when you're out of the will of God. There ain't no other time. <laughs> right? Jesus was in the perfect will of God and he faced a storm. How did he get out of it? He rebuked it because he saw that it was a demonic assignment to try to take him out, right? You have authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, but you have to use your authority. Amen. <clears throat> I remember Brother Hagin, the, the Lord was teaching Brother Hagin about uh, the believer's authority, the book Believer's Authority. And he said that he had a vision, and in the vision, the Lord was giving him some information on overcoming the enemy. And all of a sudden, he said, like a little uh, imp demon type monkey thing came over and started trying to, was blocking what Jesus was saying. And he's like, Lord, you need to move this thing. You need to move this thing. And so part of the lesson was the Lord said to him, I didn't do anything about it because you're supposed to. I gave you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions over, over all the power of the enemy. So you have to rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Right? So use your authority. So then the second storm we talked about was Jonah. So we know in the Old Testament, Jonah is a prophet of God. And God told Jonah, he said, go, go to Nineveh and prophesy against him. Now the interesting thing is, is that Jonah was a Hebrew prophet. And Hebrew prophets were not typically called to go preach to Gentile countries particularly countries that had oppressed his own nation. And so Jonah's like, I ain't doing that. No. Mm -mm. Right? And so he, says, he said, go, go to Nineveh. Jonah got in a boat and went to Tarshish, which was towards Spain. He went in the, you couldn't go in a more exact opposite, opposite direction than what he did. And so he, he, and then all of a sudden he's in this boat, <clears throat> sleep, if I remember right. So he's in this boat, all of a sudden a storm comes. His storm came because he was out of the will of God. And here's what I want you to listen to. Jonah could have rebuked the devil until Jesus comes back, and he would have never got out of his storm. Because you can't rebuke your way out of a disobedient storm. The only way you can get out is through repentance and obedience to the will of God. People say, I rebuke you, I rebuke you, and God said, when are you going to obey? <laughs> right? So, so sometimes we get into storms because we're right in the middle of the will of God, then we got to rebuke it. And then sometimes we get into storms because we didn't do something right. And then we have to have the humility to look at our own life and say, you know what, I did this, I messed up. And that's what Jonah did. Jonah repented. Got swallowed by the whale. He repented in the belly of the whale. And then he went out and did what God called him to do. Right? So you get out of disobedient storms by repentance. Now, the storm we want to deal with today is found in the book of Acts, chapter 27. Acts, chapter 27. 
And in Acts chapter 27 and verse 1, I want to read this portion of Scripture to you real quick. Acts 27. And this was the Apostle Paul. And here we see that Paul was arrested in Jerusalem and he appealed to Caesar. The reason he appealed to Caesar was because he knew he wouldn't get a fair trial. And so I want you to notice this lengthy portion of Scripture, but I want to go through this real quick with you. In Acts 27, verse 1, it says, And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some of the prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. So entering a ship of the Andromedon, we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. Aristarchus, the Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. And the next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. When, he, when we had put out to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the wind was contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea, which is off Sicily and Pamphylia, and came to Myra, a city of Lyca, there <clears throat> the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. <clears throat> and when we had sailed slowly for many days and arrived with difficulty to Snidus, the wind not permitting us to proceed, <clears throat> we sailed under the shelter of Crete, to Salmon. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lisi. Now, when much time had been spent in sailing, thank you, sir. <clears throat> when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them notice this, men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo of the ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> now, when you look at this portion of Scripture, I want to point out a couple of things. Notice right here he says, uh, verse 10, I perceive. Everybody say, I perceive. I perceive. <clears throat> what we don't realize is that or what we need to realize, I guess, is that the Spirit of God will, when we're in certain situations, the Spirit of God will direct us. <clears throat> and it's not many times, most of the time, it's not a voice from heaven saying, hello, I wish it was. <clears throat> so you knew exactly what to do. <clears throat> but many times it's a perception. You just perceive, I shouldn't do this. Or maybe you start doing something and you say, mm, I don't need to do this. That's the Spirit of God, and that was the Spirit of God directing the Apostle Paul, saying, uh, this is not good. There's going to be damage and destruction, not only for the ship, but also for our lives. And so Paul was not a mariner. He, he, he was not a fisherman or, you know, didn't do sailing and that type of thing. He was not a meteor, meteorologist. He was a preacher. But he had the Spirit of God. And guess what? You have the Spirit of God living inside of you as well. Amen. And so he knew the Holy Ghost and was led by the Spirit of God, and he had a warning. And then uh, Paul, Paul did not have the authority to make the decision not to sail because he was a prisoner. But others expressed their wishes. Paul said, we don't need to sail. And then the helmsmen, the sailors, the soldiers said, it looks good, let's go ahead. Now see, here's the problem. Sometimes we make a mistake because we're not listening to our spiritual leaders. We think we know what's best for us, and we don't recognize that God has put a shepherd over us that can see things that we can't see, and we can perceive danger, and we have the Spirit of God also, also on the inside of us leading us and guiding us. And so here these people said, well, we don't believe this man He's, he's not a sailor. He's not a meter. You know, he doesn't work. He's not giving us high point weather. <clears throat> he's a preacher. What does he know? Right? He knows the Holy Ghost. Right? And here's another side point. Even though the majority thinks they're right, they're not always right. See, it says everybody was believing the helmsman and the, the helmsman of the ship and the soldiers and everything. They didn't believe Paul. The implication was Paul was the only one that told them this isn't going to be good. Right? See, sometimes the majority is not right. Do you remember when God told them to go spy out the land of Canaan? They sent 12 spies. 
Ten of them came back with a bad report. They went with the bad report and got in trouble. Right? Which was the ten, which was the majority. <clears throat> Amen. Now, <clears throat> here's another interesting thing. The, one of the reasons that they set sail to go was because they saw that it looked, the weather looked good. So made, they made a decision based on the circumstances. Paul was trying to make a decision based on the Spirit of God. So we have to be careful because when things look easy or look good, it may not be God. Some things that are worth your time and worth your investment take effort. They take persistence to push through problems. Amen. Amen. See, some, sometimes we can make a mistake because we think, hey, well, this, this door opened up. I must be, must be God for me to walk through it. And, and no, it ain't. Then we can look at this and say, well, there's a lot of problems here. This must not be God. And God is saying, go ahead. I'm going to be with you. Amen. See, we saw that with the children of Israel. They said, well, there's Johnson in land. God says, so what? I'll be with you to deliver you and to bring you into the land. Just go ahead and keep stepping. Right? So the point is, because something looks right or because something looks wrong, that's not an indication. The indication is we're supposed to be led by the Spirit of God, not our circumstances. Not what it looks like, but what the Spirit of God and what the Word of God are directing us to do. Right? Now, here, here's, here's, the, here's the real thing when it gets down to this storm. So, Jesus got in his storm because he was in the will of God. Jonah got, out of, got in his storm because he was out of the will of God. Paul got into his storm because of the mistakes of other people. He told them not to go. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't mind paying for my mistakes. But when I got to pay for yours, <laughs> that's even more painful. Because you could have made a better decision that made everybody's life better and didn't cause all this mess that everybody else is having to deal with. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but have you suffered a storm in your life because somebody else made a decision that jacked up stuff in your life? That's what we're talking about. Somebody else made a decision and they were disobedient. They were negligent. They were reckless. They were careless, they were foolish, they were rebellious, and it messed up your situation. And you see it all the time. You see CEOs make decisions that cause problems for their employees and shareholders. You see spouses making decisions that cause pain for their spouse and for their kids. You see, you know, in the classroom, you see certain students get punished because of what another student did. I remember when I was playing basketball, we had to run. And one dude decided not to run. And so the coach said, oh, y'all going to have to run again. I'm like, hold up. I ran. This brother didn't run. He's the one that needs to be running. He said, no, y'all a unit. Everybody got to run. I said, all right, we're going to run, but we're going to see him after this workout. Because this ain't going to happen but one time. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> We're going to have a come to Jesus meeting. <laughs> so Paul, Paul was in his problem because somebody else messed him up, right? Paul, we feel your pain, right? Now, often God tries to prevent problems, but we've got to be obedient. See, they would never got into this problem if they had to listen to Paul. Amen. Do we have a man... Uh, this is connected with our ministry, and uh, he, he had dated, dated a girl for a long time, and we didn't know the girl. He came to church occasionally. She didn't come at all, never met her, and so he asked me to do premarital counseling. So I sat down with him, and we started counseling, and this girl is running him down the whole time. I mean, he don't do this. He don't do that. He's, he's bad here. He does this. But didn't say one positive thing the whole time. So we pushed through the counseling, whatever, and so he was under my ministry. I didn't really know her, right? 
And so then I'd never done this before, but I said, hey, I need to run to the store because they drove separately. I said, I need to run to the store. Can you run with me? He's like, yeah. <laughs> so we get in the car. I said, look, I got two questions for you. Number one, does she do that all the time? He said, yes. Number two, do you want to live like that for the rest of your life? No. Okay. I said, well, there you go. I said, now it's up to you. Now, I wish I could tell you he listened. But can I break it down here? (laughs) I'm just going to be straight. I tell my young men, I told him, you cannot be BBB, blinded by the booty. He was blinded, stayed with her, got into a mess. Went through it because they stayed together for so long, mixed up stuff, ended up being common law marriage. She ended up getting his retirement. I mean, all this kind. And finally, years later, they, 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 well, they never were married, but separated. But it, it was t- tremendous turmoil, drama, and problems as a result. Right? Paul said, I perceive this is going to be much, much hurt and damage. So when somebody over your life says that to you, you need to make sure to listen. Amen? Now, Paul Paul got into this storm because of other people's problems, other people's bad decisions, right? Y'all still tripping over BBB, aren't you? (laughs) All right. You know you said it at home. You just didn't expect me to say it. That's all that. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> How many of you know we need to possess our vessel with honor? That's what the Bible says. Right? That's part of integrity. You know? And later I, I talked to him. I said, you know, we, we can see what kind of woman she is, but here's my question. What kind of man do you want to be? Because that's the only place change is going to happen. Right? All right. So how did Paul get out of his storm? Paul got out of his storm. I'm going to give you a couple of keys right here. Number one, when you're going through a storm that somebody else caused, don't hold a grudge or become bitter. See, like I said, I can deal, you know, I, I regret some of the things, mistakes or something you made, but when somebody else does something that messes me up, then all of a sudden we can have some feelings about that. Right? Right? But if we're going to get out of that storm, we can't allow bitterness to get inside of us because the Bible says a root of bitterness will get inside of us and spring up and corrupt many. So if you want to be free, you can't allow bitterness to come in. Because bitterness and unforgiveness is a trap of Satan to rob you of God's blessing and your potential and your purpose. You know, we had a missionary come one time from uh, Australia, and he told us how they used to poach monkeys. And they would create a cage, and they would create a, 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 a where you could stick your hand in it, right? And they would put fruit inside, colorful fruit inside that they would eat. And so the monkey would come over, and he could put his hand through, but when he grabbed the fruit, he couldn't take his hand out. And so what they would do, they, wouldn't, they didn't use guns. They didn't use anything. They just nailed this, you know, strapped it to the ground, put it in there, and the monkey would grab that fruit and yank it and yank it and pull it and pull it, and they would just walk over to him and club him and kill him. And so the, the reason, all he had to do, listen to me. All that monkey had to do to be free was let go. (laughs) 
but he didn't because he felt like he had a right. They hurt me. They did me wrong. And Satan's clubbing them. When all I got to do to be free is let go. Let go. The Bible says in Proverbs 4, verse 23, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. Keep your heart, guard your heart. And look, everybody has to deal with this stuff. Because there's, you know, people do mean and hurtful things. Sometimes people are evil, they do malicious things. Sometimes we get hurt from people that didn't intend to, but they hurt us anyway. So we have to forgive, we have to walk in love. And I'm not saying be stupid. I can forgive you, but that don't mean I trust you. Whenever you're around, I'm going to walk backwards. I ain't turning my back on you. Right? But I mean, I, I had to walk through it. I mean, we had a staff member we highly invested in, loved, spent a lot of time with, betrayed us, started talking about us. People left the church, listened to them, didn't talk to us. Right? And then a, a person that you, I mean, we, we paid for their school. We paid for meals. We did different things. We invested them at a high level, took them to meetings, paid for expense trips, paid for meetings. And then betrays us. Talks about trying to do damage and destroy what God wants to do. Got it I broke bread with. Got it I, I worked out with him. And so I remember, you know, we had, I confronted him and they left and blah, 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 and still went around talking about us, doing all kinds of stuff. But the problem was I, I still went to the same gym he went to. And then I would hear reports that he was still doing stuff. And so I would see him at the gym. I'm going to tell you right now, I had some feelings. I remember one day, you know, some days you're just a little bit more in the flesh than you are in the spirit. Maybe you didn't have your coffee that morning. But I was just a little bit more on the flesh side than the spirit side. See, look, just because I got reverend in front of my name don't mean that I don't have to walk this out just like you do. I got to practice the word just like you do. And I went in that day, and I am telling you the truth. I went in that day, and I saw that man, and I had heard something he said again. And I thought, my, this thought came to me, just look at me the wrong way today. <laughs> Just look at me the wrong. You don't even have to say nothing. Just look at me the wrong way today. <laughs> mm. I had just got through watching a Badia movie too. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Thank God he didn't look at me. You know, thank God for his grace. Because I'll admit, I was offended. I was hurt. Right? I was offended and hurt. And so I had to forgive. But that was a process for me because, you know, it's one thing somebody does something and then they're gone. But if you have to see them every day. Right? So I had to forgive. I forgave and then I had to forgive the next day because I saw him. Then I had, then I forgave and I saw him the next day. I had to forgive again. There's a reason Jesus said you got to forgive 70 times seven because every time I see you, I got to forgive you <laughs> until it works out of me. Right? And so, but then I was sitting there thinking and then when I got calm and everything calmed down and I was thinking, you know, it probably wouldn't be good if Pastor Jack's a former member at local gym. That would probably not be the best headline in the newspaper, right? Right? Everybody say, keep your heart right. Keep your heart right. <clears throat> now think about Paul. Paul, he told these people not to go. They are the ones that are, are keeping him chained. I mean, he could have said, you know what? Y'all a bunch of dummies. But I'm going to show you something about the Apostle Paul. Uh, Let me show you. Let me show you this. This is powerful. 
So one, no bitterness. Everybody say no bitterness. No bitterness. All right, look. <clears throat> so when you read, keep reading the text, uh, they threw stuff overboard. Uh, verse 19, the third day we threw the ship's tackle overboard. There was neither sun nor stars appeared for many days. Think about that. It was black for days. Okay? No small tempest. Be not, little knows this. All hope that we would be saved was finally given up. Everybody thought they are going to die. But after a long absence of, of food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not sailed from Crete. I love Paul, don't you? Yeah. Paul said, Look, y'all, if y'all had to listen to me to start with, we wouldn't be in this mess. Right? He said, And incurred this disaster and loss, and now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong. And whom I serve. This is a side note, but you shouldn't just belong to him. You should also serve him. Saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heed, take heart, men, for I believe God. Everybody say, I believe God. God. That it will be just as it was told me. Now, as you read the rest of the account, you need to see that the storm, the ship was broken up, but nobody lost their life. Okay? So exactly what God told them came to pass. So number two, I'm going to give this to you real quick. In the middle of the storm, remember who you are and who you serve. Satan wants to get your mind convinced that there's no help for you. There's no deliverance for you. There's no way out of this situation. But Paul says, look, I, there stood before me an angel of God whom I belong to. I belong to God and I serve God. And God is bigger than my problem. God is bigger than my situation. Amen. God is bigger than what, the, the circumstances that are before me. <clears throat> See, we have to remember when we're going through it, I am a child of God. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God is my very present help in time of trouble. I have to remember who I am. And I have to keep his word. You know, when you're going through that, you got to keep the word in front of your eyes. Because Satan's objective is to get your mind on the problem and not the solution to the problem. Number three, pray. I mentioned this, but you know what's powerful about this? And you see really the heart of the Apostle Paul. Remember we read in this verse, it says, there stood, when Paul stood before these men and he says, God has granted you those on the ship. That's interesting language because it implies that Paul prayed not only for his deliverance, but for everybody else on the ship. Listen to me. He prayed not only for himself, but he prayed for the people that got him in the mess. That guy I told you about early, I probably prayed for him more than anybody else in my life. Not as much for him. Prayer does something on the inside of you. But Paul prayed for the people that got him into the problem. And the Bible says God has granted you all those who are on the ship. Why did he grant them? Because he asked. Right? He granted you. The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Amen. God will protect us in the middle of the storms. We had a lady at our church one time and her son drank gasoline. And so she called 911. They were shipping him to the emergency room. And... We're talking about prayer, right? So they're going to the emergency room. Son's just drunk gasoline, right? And so she's praying. She jumps in, the, in there, and thank God she knew who to call. She knew who she belonged to. She knew to pray. So she starts praying. She starts praying in the Holy Ghost, praying in the Spirit. I'd be doing the same thing, right? She starts praying in the Spirit, and all of a sudden, one of the PMT says, um, well, what, what are you saying? She said, I ain't got time right now, and she keeps on praying. Listen, sometimes ain't nobody got time for that. You got to stay on task. Because nobody else on there knew how to pray but you. 
And so God put you in that situation so you knew how to get out of that situation. And you got the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The Bible says it makes tremendous power available, dynamic, and it's working. Amen. Amen. Number four, believe God and exercise faith. Acts 27 verse 5, Paul said, therefore take heart, men, for I believe God. Everybody say, I believe God. He said, I believe God that it will be just as it has told me. If you have a pen, underline that. I believe God. When you're going through this, it takes perseverance, and you have to stay committed. He said, I believe God. In other words, what Paul was seeing then different, was different than what God witnessed to the apostle Paul. Paul. The Bible says all hope on the natural was gone. Right? They hadn't eaten for two weeks. The Bible says this storm lasted for 14 days. 14 days. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> just to give you a little example of what there was, this was like, well, I took a trip uh, to the island of Patmos. So we were doing a, a biblical study, and a lot of the seven churches are in the nation of uh, Turkey. The seven churches are in Turkey. And so I was doing a study, but one of the excursions was we went over to the island of Patmos where John wrote the book of Revelation. So it's about a four-hour boat ride, Okay. So we had this 45-foot boat with about 28 passengers on it. Well, <clears throat> fortunately, I grew up in North Carolina, and my dad liked to fish. And I like roller coasters. So I was used to the water and rocking, and I like roller coasters and stuff like that. And God's favor was on me. But we had 28 people that was on this boat, and it was choppy water. I mean, we were, the boat was going like this for four hours. Okay? It was moving, moving, moving. So about 85 to 90 percent of the people got seasick. I mean, people were sick everywhere, all over the boat, okay? I got queasy once, and I'm rebuking and praying and believing, and I didn't get sick, but some people got sick multiple times, right? Now, listen to me. That was four hours. This was 14 days like that. So when it says they didn't eat, there's a reason, right? See, sometimes storms become difficult not because of their severity, but because of their longevity, This took a long time, so we have to make sure that we're not discouraged, that we continue to pray, that we continue to have faith and believe God. I believe God that it will be told, that it would, what he's told me is coming to pass. See, Paul couldn't put his faith in what he saw. He couldn't put his faith in what the soldiers were saying. He couldn't put his faith in what the helmsman were saying or the captain of the ship. He had to put his faith in what God said. And if you're going to overcome the storms of life, you're going to have to have your faith in what God said about your situation. God always causes me to triumph. I am more than a conqueror through Christ. God shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I am healed by God. And the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me and quickens my mortal body. Amen. Finally, number five, and we're done. Persevere and refuse to give up. I like something Winston Churchill said. He was a former prime minister of Great Britain. He said, if you're going through hell, don't stop. If you're going through hell, don't stop. <clears throat> See, it, wasn't, it was the longevity of this storm, but Paul got out of it because of his perseverance. He got out of it because of his faith. He got out of it because of his prayer. He got out of it because he didn't allow bitterness because somebody made a decision and messed up his life. Right? And we have to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Hebrews 6.12 says imitate those who faith and patience inherit the promises. Sometimes we have a problem with faith, but patience is the problem. Because we want a drive-through breakthrough. But sometimes it takes, it takes faith. It takes persistence. I'm not going to quit. If this is not the outcome God wants for me, then I'm not going to settle for it. Don't let the devil distort God's purpose and plan for your life. Don't let the devil distort what God wants to do for you. He wants to do good things. He has plans to prosper you and to give you hope in the future. 
being confident in this very thing, he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So if what you're experiencing in your life is not good, then it's not God, and don't settle with it because it's not what God wants. So be, be persistent. Refuse to quit. And make sure, make sure you analyze your life. Now this morning, you may be in here and you, you're like, I, there was times where we're, we're in ministry, right? God wants to do great things, but now I'm dealing, I'm dealing with this person who's betrayed me and, and hurt me to the core. So I, I can either let go or I can hold on. I can let go and let God take me into the destiny and purpose he has for me, or I can hold on and allow the enemy to hold me back. <clears throat> and one of the keys I want to share with you this morning, the things we deposit into your life, and you know what the Spirit of God is speaking to you about, but <clears throat> I believe there's some that have been holding on to something that somebody's done. And God is saying to you, it's time to let it go. There's too much good that God has for your life. Listen, listen. This is where it makes it real right here. When they did something to you, that event was over. It may have had collateral damage, but it, that event is over. But if you hold on to unforgiveness and bitterness, then you're allowing them to continue every day to torment your life and to hinder God's blessing. <laughs> 